Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Bars. I'm your host, Mansa Musa. And I'm Maximilian Alvarez, editor-in-chief here at The Real News Network. This is a special edition of Rattling the Bars, which The Real News is going to be publishing on August 21st, on the 52nd anniversary of the death of black political revolutionary George Jackson. Born in 1941, Jackson grew up in poverty in Chicago. As a black boy in a deeply segregated America, Jackson, like so many others, was marked from birth. At best, he was not seen at all, a non-entity, a second or third class person in a society made by and for white people. At worst, he was seen only as a criminal in waiting, condemned to prison or death for the crime of his blackness. Jackson did, in fact, spend much of his life plagued by the law and the carceral system, and he did, in fact, die in prison. But through his writing, particularly his collection of letters from prison published under the title Soledad Brother, Jackson would become one of the most prominent and revolutionary black voices speaking from the underworld. Now, of course, as the editor-in-chief of The Real News Network, I have had the great honor to work with Mansa Musa and our dearly departed mentor and comrade, Eddie Conway. And, you know, Mansa has spent 48 years locked up, uh, Eddie, 44 years as political prisoners in the United States of America. And, you know, I have frankly lost count of the times that George Jackson's name has come up in conversations with Mansa and Eddie over the past few years. So to commemorate the anniversary of Jackson's death and to celebrate his life and work, we wanted to devote a full Rattling the Bars conversation to Jackson himself and to take a moment to hear more from Mansa uh, about what Jackson has meant to him, to Eddie, and to all those in the struggle for black liberation and the struggle to dismantle the prison industrial complex. But I know that you know, for a lot of us, uh, you know, this is history that we may not be familiar with, and it's not exactly actively taught in schools. And so if you all will permit me, um, I wanted to read a chunk quote from the 1994 edition of Soledad Brother, published by Lawrence Hill Books, which contains a tight two-page sort of historical summary of Jackson, his life, and, and his death. And so I promise I will shut up after I read this lengthy passage, but I think it's important just to give y'all as much context up front, especially for those uh, who were not taught uh, about George Jackson in school. So in the edition of Soledad Brother that I referenced, um, the introduction states, quote, In 1960... At the age of 18, George Jackson was accused of stealing $70 from a gas station in Los Angeles. Though there was evidence of his innocence, his court-appointed lawyer maintained that because Jackson had a record, i.e. two previous instances of petty crime, he should plead guilty in exchange for a light sentence in the county jail. He did, and received an indeterminate sentence of one year to life. Jackson spent the next 10 years in Soledad prison, seven and a half of them in solitary confinement. Instead of succumbing to the dehumanization of prison existence, he transformed himself into the leading theoretician of the prison movement and a brilliant writer. Soledad Brother, which contains the letters that he wrote from 1964 to 1970, is his testament. In his 28th year, Jackson and two other black inmates, Fleeta Drumgo and John Cluche, were falsely accused of murdering a white prison guard. The guard was beaten to death on January 16, 1969, a few days after another white guard shot and killed three black inmates by firing from a tower into the courtyard. The accused men were brought in chains and shackles to two secret hearings in Salinas County. A third hearing was about to take place when John Cluche managed to smuggle a note to his mother, quote, help, I'm in trouble, end quote. With the aid of a state senator, his mother contacted a lawyer and so commenced one of the most extensive legal defenses in U.S. history. 
According to their attorneys, Jackson, Drumgo, and Cluche were charged with murder not because there was any substantial evidence of their guilt, but because they had been previously identified as black militants by the prison authorities. If convicted, they would face a mandatory death penalty under the California Penal Code. Within weeks, the case of the Soledad brothers emerged as a political cause celebre for all sorts of people demanding change at a time when every American institution was shaken by black rebellions in more than 100 cities and the mass movement against the Vietnam War. August 7, 1970, just a few days after George Jackson was transferred to San Quentin, the case was catapulted to the forefront of national news when his brother, Jonathan, a 17-year-old high school student in Pasadena, staged a raid on the Marin County Courthouse with a satchel full of handguns, an assault rifle, and a shotgun hidden under his coat. Educated into a political revolutionary by George, Jonathan invaded the court during a hearing for three black San Quentin inmates, not including his brother, and handed them weapons. As he left with the inmates and five hostages, including the judge, Jonathan demanded that the Soledad brothers be released within 30 minutes. In the shootout that ensued, Jonathan was gunned down. Of Jonathan, George wrote, quote, He was free for a while. I guess that's more than most of us can expect, end quote. Soledad Brother, which is dedicated to Jonathan Jackson, was released to critical acclaim in France and the United States with an introduction by the renowned French dramatist Jean Genet in the fall of 1970. Less than a year later, and just two days before the opening of his trial, George Jackson was shot to death by a tower guard inside San Quentin Prison in a purported escape attempt. Quote, no black person, wrote James Baldwin, will ever believe that George Jackson died the way they tell us he did. End quote. Okay, so again, apologies for that lengthy introduction, but as I said before, we wanted to try to squeeze in as much historical context for you all before we really dig into George Jackson, uh, to his book Soledad Brother, and the effect that it had on folks in and outside of prison. Um, but Mansa, I wanted to turn things over to you and, and ask if, you know, before we dig into Jackson himself and Soledad Brother, let's take viewers and listeners back to that moment in history, 1970. This is right before you yourself entered the prison system. You know, you and I have talked about this on other episodes about the state of the country and what was going on around you at that time. So just before we, we talk about George Jackson, take us back to that moment. What do you think people today need to remember about what was going on in the country at that time and what was going on in the prisons at that time? You know, that's a good observation, uh, Max, because what was going on, we're talking about during that period you had the war in Vietnam was at its height. Uh, so the, the biggest thing that was going on in this country was the the, war, the uh, protests against the war in Vietnam. That in and of itself gave uh, a lot of attention to uh, social disupheaval. Uh, radicals on the left, uh, militants, black and white, was protesting the war in Vietnam, but more importantly, the, con the social conditions that it was existing in the black community. Yeah, the, the civil rights movement was, was peaking, uh, and you had the Black Panther Party that, that came into existence. Then, so in society in general, you had an all-out war by the government, the fascists, against any type of social discontent, any type of social upheaval. This was what was going on at that time. You had the war in Vietnam, you had the civil rights movement, and you had, uh, in the South, you had Jim Crow running the muck. In the North, you had Jim Crow running the muck in the form of a different uh, color. And you had a, what, what the Citizen Project, NANADOV, it's 50 years in the wake of the, the utilization of the prison industrial complex to control social disupheaval. So now you have in the 50, in the 70s, that's when you had the mass incarceration start taking shape. 
Mm. You know, I think um, it was it was Eddie on a previous Rattling the Bars episode or an interview that he did where he said something that really stuck with me. It was like, you know, from the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, the black power movement. He said, you know, the moment that black people started rising up and demanding accountability for what had been what white society had done to them for 400 years, that's when the prison started swelling with mm. black bodies. Right. And thus, you know, we get the mass, the the era of mass incarceration, the expansion of the prison industrial complex, you know, famously termed the new Jim Crow. Mm. Right. Um, but I wanted to also ask, like, um, what it was like inside the prisons at that time um because you know that was not a pretty picture either right and so now you have you have the attica rebellion right but during that time in the 70s you had every major institution prison in the united states of america has some type of rebellion which they dub rise but this was rebellion against rebellion against inhumane and oppressive prison conditions so this is what you had coming in, this is what you had in the prison. So when you read about uh, George Jackson and you read about uh, the prison guards killing three unarmed individuals in the courtyard, that was common practice in the United States of America because you had, like, in Texas prison, it was the condition was so bad in Texas prison that a prisoner filed a lawsuit. He wrote it on toilet paper to get the lawsuit out and into the uh, court system in order for them to reverse the inhumane living conditions. So inhumanity and inhumane living conditions in prison, this was common practice. So in the prison, it was like right for uh, prisoners to come together around changing the conditions that they found themselves on. It wasn't necessarily came around a particular ideology. They came around the ideology of we want to be treated better than we're being treated. It wasn't that in Attica, they came together around an ideology that, oh, this is our ideology. No, they came together around one that we're being oppressed and dehumanized, and we can't continue to live like this because we're dying off, so we might well die fighting, mm -hmm. standing on our feet dying, as opposed to be laying down and just cow because mm -hmm. we're going to die. Mm. Man, I can't, I got like chills just even thinking about being in that position but like you said yeah it's like that was basically the choice at that point you get explosions like the attica uprising because it's like well we're gonna die here anyway and we're being picked off and malnourished so like mm -hmm. what else do we have to lose at this point but then like you said before and as we've talked about uh, off camera many times like then you had this sort of political awakening, you know, and George Jackson played a huge role in that. So I wanted to ask if you could, if you could remember the first time that you read Soledad, brother, like what sort of impression did it leave on you? Um, and how did it change your thinking? Like, like what was it about Jackson's story and his writing that struck so many people, including yourself on the inside? That's a good uh, point. I remembered I was in the county jail, and I knew the circumstance I was locked up for, the probability of me getting out anytime soon was slim to none. And a friend of mine, a young lady, had sent me a copy of Richard Wright, Native Son, and George Jackson, Prison Letters, Soul Dad Brothers. And when I read the Soul Dad Brothers, what resonated with me was I could understand George the way he came from, the conditions that he lived under. When he talked about living in Watts, he talked about the relationship between being poor and living in a poor environment and the, the, the conditions that they lived under, how those things created a certain mindset in his family, uh, his father, the way his father went to work. All these things resonated with me because I lived in that same kind of environment. So for me, reading his letters, started opening my eyes up to realize that I was that individual that he talked about when he spoke about the goal and objective of the prisoners in the California prison system. William Noel was to change the criminal mentality into a revolutionary mentality because that's what George had been transformed from, a criminal mentality to a revolutionary mentality. I became, I understood that and 
the impact it had on me, it made me want to learn more. It made me want to understand more about what exactly was this uh, that he was talking about. And that opened the door for me to do more reading and more studying and ultimately led me into a position where I started identifying with certain revolutionary struggles and revolutionary politics. Mm. Well, and like, I guess to kind of hook this back to the to the first question, like like what was going on in the country around 1970, um, and you entered the prison system in 71? In 70, yep, 72. 72, that's right. Um, and so I remember you and I in a past conversation, like, you know, we had talked about what it was like for you growing up in, in and around D.C., you know, in like the 60s. And so much of what you told me then was was resonating when I was reading George Jackson's prison letters, because it's like the way he describes white society and and being black in white society, like Richard Wright, mm. right, is like it's like an occupation. I think he calls it a, <laughs> a, a crisis existence. Right. So you're constantly kind of living in a state of emergency and like every aspect of your existence feels like life under an occupying mm -hmm. force, right? And that you're just trying to sort of evade as best you can, but eventually it comes for for everyone. And it feels like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I was just asking like, did it feel that way for you? Like before going into the prison system, like, like what chance do I have in this society when there are even parts of DC I can't go in, I can't get certain types of jobs, I'm not going to get certain kinds of, you know, benefits mm -hmm. um, to build a kind of, dignified middle class life, you know, as a black man in America. And and Malcolm said best I say that the oppression that was existed in within the black community created a sense of inadequacy in black men, in particular because when when we talking about we're talking about a period where you had the civil rights movement, then you assassinate Dr. King. So after when Dr. King get assassinated, every every town, everywhere in the United States goes up in smoke. Not because people identify with Dr. King and his nonviolent philosophy, but because they realize at that juncture that he was a man that was advocating a peaceful coexistence, and you kill them all. We living in the most horrible and decadent living conditions. So, what chance do we stand if you kill them off just for speaking nonviolent? So, when 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 that's how I felt. I felt like okay, that eventually. I don't have no way out of this lifestyle or this that's imposed upon me in these oppressive conditions. Ultimately, I'm gonna wind up either dead or in prison. And so when I got in prison and then I come in contact with George Jackson, and he's saying the same thing. He's saying, like, ultimately, I'm gonna wind up in dead or in prison. So he he's speaking to me, and he's speaking to thousands and hundreds of thousands of other prisoners that live this experience. So he's speaking about a life that all of us live in different social, economic, and political conditions within society, but all of us had that same thing in common, poor black and in real trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to bring Eddie into the conversation. Because like you said, the, um, a friend had sent you George Jackson's prison letters when you were in the county jail getting ready to go to prison for what you knew was going to be a long time. Um, but then, as you said, like George Jackson's prison letters impacted so many people beyond yourself. So as we've talked about in previous episodes, I know that you and Eddie and others on the inside, you guys were turning over milk crates. You were reading Mao's little red book, getting into revolutionary conversations. Where did George Jackson fit into that? Like what kinds of conversations would you and Eddie and others get into about Jackson um, inside the prison? And and that's a that's an interesting question because when you look at Comrade George, that's what is commonly referred to by everybody. We'll refer look, to him as Comrade George yeah, from now Yeah, when you look at Comrade George and Comrade George, like he, on the heels of prison letters, he wrote Blood in My Eyes. And in Blood in My Eyes, you, you got a chance to see how how much he was an astute political student. And this is what really, when our conversation about Conrad George was, because most time, most people 
in, in during that period, they were they were romanticized Conrad Joy, you know his writings, you know, and so in in terms of like identifying with him as an individual, they identified more with his uh, revolutionary stance in terms of his military being a military strategist. But Eddie and we we identified with George Jackson for we knew him to be a, an astute political student. And he understood the politics, the revolutionary politics, because he understood this here, that if you don't have a, a political understanding and you're kind, you don't have no political ideology, you don't have no political position, then no matter what you say, it's, it's going to be for nothing because you're not going, when you're talking about revolution, you're talking about going to people, organizing people to understand the need and the necessity to overthrow a government or a country. You can't get them to, to get that understanding on the strength of might alone. Mm -hmm. You have to educate them on the strength of understanding that the conditions they live under are bad and that it's a better way to live and educate them on what this means in terms of taking a stand. And this is what we, this is our conversation we had about Conrad Joy. We, had, we looked at him from him being an astute political thinker and understanding his, his uh, essays, you know, and his works, his writings, in the context of that. And and because of that, we was able to, when we had a conversation about, we was able to, like, take a lot of his works towards United Front where he, he did this analysis on the, the sheer size of the prison industrial complex versus uh, the amount of people in there automatic open the door for a Unitarian type organization. This is political, this is astute political thinking to see the connection between the prison industrial complex during that time and how it could be utilized and organized for revolutionary activity. This, this, this is what we talked about. We talked about that part of George Jackson. We recognized that he was a, uh, the field marshal general. We recognized that he was a, a military strategist for us. But at the same time, we knew that he was an astute political thinker. Well, and, you know, you, Eddie, and so many others are, like, living proof of that thesis, right? It's like, as we said... You know, in direct response to black America rising up and demanding accountability for 400 plus years of white supremacist racial terror and oppression, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, we have a period in the 50s and 60s where it feels like, you know, uh, maybe the balance is going to shift. But then we create this this explosive expansion of the prison industrial complex to try to capture all of that uh, revolutionary energy, especially coming from black America, but not exclusively. Also, like you said, even white Latino uh, American Indian movement. Right. They, they went after all of us, but like they definitely went after, you know, black revolutionaries, especially. And so in that situation, you have kind of two choices. It's like, okay, either a whole generation of revolutionaries get swallowed up and lost to history, or they get swallowed up like Jonah and the whale, and you guys start organizing mm -hmm. inside the whale. <laughs> and, right, and you're right. like, we don't know if we're ever going to get out of here, but like these are our conditions, and this is the this is the flock we have to work with. This is the world in which we can organize. So it's either do that or, or like die, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like an incredible tale, but I wanted to like kind of drill down on that even more because you mentioned this quote and, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it like uh, in, in even more depth because this is at the end of George, Comrade George's um, first letter in Soledad Brother where uh, he writes, quote, I met Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Engels, and Mao when I entered prison and they redeemed me. For the first four years, I studied nothing but economics and military ideas. I met black guerrillas, George Big Jake Lewis, and James Carr, W.L. Nolan, Bill Christmas, Tory Gibson, and many, many others. We attempted to transform the black criminal mentality into a black revolutionary mentality. As a result, each of us has been subjected to years of the most vicious reactionary violence by the state, end quote. So let's talk about transforming the black criminal mentality to a black revolutionary mentality. What did that mean to you? And what did that transformation look like for all of you on the inside? 
the first thing you're going to recognize is that you ain't taking no more BS. <laughs> you know, now you're aware of who you are and you recognize that, you know, you have a certain right to be treated a certain way. So we talk about William Noel and he talked about Big Jake and them. These are the people that educated him. These are the people he came in contact with. These are the people that, these are the comrades that when they were together, they was having their political education classes. They were talking about, like you say, Marx, Lenin, you know, Engel. You know, these, these were the conversations. They was having the same thing we was having. We was having these same conversations. But more importantly, these we wasn't just theorizing. We was looking at conditions within the prison and starting to demand certain changes in the way we were being living and the way we was being treated. This is why you had the Attica uprising. You know, people will be starting to become educated about the way they, they're being treated and their rights. In George, in Conrad George's situation, they became more politicized, and in becoming politicized, they recognize that it's only through raising the consciousness of the, the prison population that we're going to be effective in terms of changing the conditions, not only inside, but also changing the conditions in society. Because we're not confined to uh, the prison walls you know, our, our horizon goes beyond the prison walls in terms of our thinking. So in our case, this is what it looked like for me. What it looked like for me was I recognized that, okay, no matter where I'm at, I have a right to be treated as a human being. No matter where I'm at, the conditions that I live under, I have a right to have them conditions reflect or treat me like a human being. And more importantly, that they're going to have to change these conditions or it's going to be a problem. So this is what we did. We organized, you know, in terms like the medical. We organized in terms like the food. But this came out of our political education. Our political ed education told us that if you're not being treated right, it's, it's, it's not about rebel rousing. It's not about rah, rah, rah. It's about doing the grunt work, getting down, telling people, listen, we have a right to have adequate medical treatment. And the way we're going to go about getting adequate medical treatment is we're going to boycott something in the institution. We're not going to go to work in the industry. We're not going to go in the kitchen. We're not going to come out of cell. We're going to make them come to us and ask us what's going on and we're going to tell them. This is what happened with George. That's why they was marked. They was marked because they challenged the, the, the prison industrial company. They challenged the powers to be. So, and they was in an environment where they had no restraints in terms of the police, because the police in, in the California prison carried guns on the catwalk. Or when you went out in the yard, they carried, they, they was they was armed, locked, and loaded. If an event that one of their agents, Aryan, you know, they told them to go star something, you know, star something and didn't duck. You know, star something and didn't get out of the way. And that's what happened with, uh, that's what happened with William Nolan and them, that's what happened with them. And so it was inevitable that they were going to come and get somebody, they were going to come and get three prisoners. It was inevitable that when, when they came and got George Jackson, Solar Brothers, which turned out to be Solar Brothers, John Clichet, Fleet of Drummer, and George Jackson, it was inevitable. It would, if they didn't exist, they were going to come and get three, four, or five per people because they knew that they couldn't say who did what to this prison guard, but they knew that everybody in that prison felt that way towards them guards. So, it was like, pick, just pick somebody. And they just had to pick George because they probably was the most vocal in terms of organizing and educating prisoners. Right, and it's just like, you know, when you live in a society like the United States of America, which beats into our brains from birth this sort of individualist fiction. Right. This this belief that like um, that we're all just, you know, free floating individuals uh, who can attain the American dream if we just work hard enough. And, you know, that that we alone are responsible for everything that happens to us. Right. In that kind of society, like, you know, if you break the law, if you get in, if you get put in prison, like you are just a criminal, you mm -hmm. are. You, you, you are an individual, a bad individual who needs to be reformed. But like going from that to thinking about, well, I grew up in a society where black people can't even live outside of like 
the poor parts of the na- of the city, right? We can't even get the kinds of jobs to afford to support ourselves. We're getting harassed every step we take on the street by the police, right? I mean, we're getting, you know, victimized by the Klan. I mean, like just all you start to see all the different conditions that leave you with, like you said, like uh, earlier about yourself, like you kind of know that you're either going to end up dead or in prison anyway. Mm-hmm. But once you sort of develop a systemic critique of the conditions that leave so few choices for black men like yourself, it's like that's an important part of understanding or transferring the criminal mentality to a revolutionary mm-hmm. mentality, is seeing first the conditions and then changing those conditions, mm-hmm. organizing, doing the grunt work to change those conditions. I mean, I think that's that's... I mean, that's as uh, eternal and relevant of a message as I can think of. But mm-hmm. I wanted to sort of end on that note, you know, because here we are 52 years after Comrade George's death. Um, I wanted to ask, like, what you think George Jackson's legacy is today and and why you still think that that his work, his words and that legacy that he left is still relevant for us here in the struggle today in 2023? And, and you know, that's that's really a very good question in, in, in the context of why, what we're talking about. When you think about George Jackson's legacy, we have what we call Black August. And Black August is, is like the outgrowth of George Jackson. We have, like, when you say Black Lives Matter, all these movements that we see today, you can trace their lineage back to George Jackson, the Black Panther Party, and people that was in that space, civil rights. This George Jackson legacy today is that he, his, what he thought, what he believed, is still going on as we speak today. You still have us organizing in prison. You still have us organizing around social conditions in society. You still have people taking a stand against inhumane and oppressive conditions. George Jackson legacy is the legacy of Harry Tubman, George Jackson's legacy is a legacy of all those former slaves that fought the Nat Turners. George Jackson's legacy is a legacy of everybody that took a stand against oppression and dehumanization. And because of this, we're here today to say that we can speak openly about things and in prison to date, even with all the oppression and dehumanization that's going on, people are standing up because they know that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And we want to close on this note by acknowledging that in terms of standing for something, we ask that you stand with rattling the bars and the real news because it's events like this here that we talk about George Jackson, we talk about Malcolm X, we talk about our beloved Conrad, Eddie Conway. But more importantly, we talk about issues that are relevant to changing the attitudes and changing the conditions in society or giving voice to people that don't have a voice. And it's important that we be in the space to give voice to people that don't have a voice. So we won't tell people what to say, but give people the opportunity to say what they want to say about the situation and aid in the system in getting that message out. And we ask you to continue to support the real news and rallying the bars as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.